Okay, we've got time for just a little bit of open season here for the panelists themselves. So there's four of them. They've got us started with their positions, and now I'm going to let them actually kind of tear into each other a little bit, sharpen each other up. Okay, we are driving here toward application. So just bear that in mind as you sharpen each other's ideas. Also deal with the implications as well. Um, so I'm going to leave this time to you. Is there somebody who'd lead us off with a question for one of the other panelists? I have a question, Kevin, for you. Uh, you just told us to make technology inconvenient. Doesn't that fly in the face of technology itself? That depends a lot on what your aim is in utilizing these technologies in the first place. So um, my wife would look at me really weird if I brought the garage tools into the kitchen. And I think that's the way we should think about the way that these other technologies are pervading our lives and keeping them in the right places for their appropriate uses. So why not just leave it alone? Why, not have, why have technology at all if you want to be inconvenient? Sure, okay, so technology is a way that we are subduing the earth. We're creating tools by which we can harness you know, creation and, and, and we can, we're, we're opening up all sorts of capabilities and, and that's a good thing. I see that as a, as a very connected thing to God's commandment to subdue the earth. But let's make sure that we are doing that in a way that's consistent with the principles that Jesus himself has given us. Chris, I have a question for you. And uh, related a little bit to what uh, Kevin brought up and something that is important to me, and that is the purpose and context of life is relationship. It's a statement I say a lot when I speak on it. Relationship being the purpose and context of life. And in my my wife, wife works in an early childhood education and secular firm, and they are always saying that education should be in the context of relationship. This is a secular organization. They say the best education that happens relationship-based. And you alluded to using the internet uh, show or maybe a YouTube uh, to look at woodworking, okay? And so my assumption is that you are willing to develop or going, enter into a relationship with someone, it's a parasocial relationship with a woodworking expert, as opposed to a relationship with a real person who knows woodworking. Is that, what are your thoughts? I think that's a great question. I think that what you're asking about is um, sort of a subversion of the traditional hierarchy, parents, children, and so on and so forth. But to be frank, you mentioned Socrates and reading. Reading already does that. You go to a library, you have the ability to engage with the minds of philosophers, past, present, dead, gone. So if we've accepted books, and we all have, I think that it's far too late. You know, it's already here. That, that subversion is already here. There's already a way to subvert. I do think there is something to be said about the different ways of learning and the different types of learning. So um, I'm sure we all know kinesthetic learners, visual, or oral learners. And in fact, for some people, visually seeing a sculpture, a, a carpentry sculpture, may be more conducive to their learning than simply step one, step two, step three. So I think that um, the subversion of these power structures are, are already here. And subversion is perhaps a too strong of a word. I think that you mentioned relationships. Relationships are more than just a hierarchical family unit. And so if you're not necessarily able to handle any sort of relationship outside of that family unit, maybe there's a deeper problem there. Okay, what, what I'm uh, aiming at though, something that happened, in my own, uh, happened to me in my own life, is my uh, deciding to, I guess the, the first course of action when trying to get help, going to the internet, as opposed to going to a human being. And in your woodworking business, or your desires to learn woodworking, it just seems to me that a first step ought to be, who's a real human being that can teach me in which I can develop a relationship with, as opposed to working on the internet in which I'm developing a relationship with someone that does, that's not there. You're developing the relationship, 
with someone you don't know, a parasocial relationship. And so that's my, anyways, my point I, I push back at. I think it's more profitable with a human being rather than a device. Yeah, I agree. Ultimately, human interaction is how God made us, and nothing beats human face-to-face -face interaction. I just don't necessarily think it's, it's an, an inherent evil. You know, generally, if I were to pick something up like that, it would be, it could be any other hobby, playing the guitar. Um, there could be a teacher, but it may be after a long day of work. I've got maybe 30 minutes, you know, just can't necessarily call someone over. I, I think that's the same as reading a book. Uh, is it possible that we could approach this question from the standpoint of good, better, best? So if, if it's necessary to acquire a new skill and there really is no one accessible to me that can teach me that skill, then you know, it's still good for me to find this information uh, somewhere, but it's not good if I am circumventing or avoiding these natural opportunities for, or these opportunities for natural relationships. One of the really interesting things about technology and one of the realizations experts, especially secular experts, are making is that technology itself and our use of it has a formative effect apart from the content. So content is important. What you're looking at is significant and media is obviously part of that. However, the use of the medium itself has a formative effect too. So we've got to be aware of that. We've got to learn how to see that effect and how to decode it and respond to it. So let's move on if there's any other questions or things you want to direct at each other. Kevin? Sure, so I have a question for you, Gary. You talked a lot about accountability. And I would just say that the general feel I got from your suggestion sounded like something that should be thought about and um, incorporated by a church leader, church leadership, at least generally with how our communities function. And so what would you say to somebody out here who's, who may be from a church that really isn't prepared or isn't inclined to handle things the way you're describing and is saying, I need support, I need accountability, I need someone to walk with me, what should I do? It's a great question and also a difficult one. Um, I do think the first plan of action should be going face to face and talking to that leader. Uh, do it humbly and give time even for change. I don't think change has to happen overnight. Sometimes in our youth we assume that, that because it's so clear what needs to happen, it needs to happen now. Uh, there needs to be respect in that process. But I don't think we should back off from doing that. Going ahead and, and laying down uh, our, our request, how we're seeing this thing. One of the burdens I think that young people put on, on leaders is this, is leaders aren't sure how committed the youth is to their group, to their, to their congregation. And I think a young man should commit himself, so he should, he should be able to say, that I'm, I'm here with you, I'm not running off if you answer this question wrong, I'm with you, but this is my burden. It's much easier for a leader then to give good advice if he first senses there's commitment here, instead of I've got one foot over here and one foot over here and you tell me the wrong answer and I'm out of here. That's, that's difficult for a leader. I'd like to just touch on again the the question of accountability with this um, pretty pervasive problem of pornography, even within the Christian community. And that is the, the uh, fear that men have of exposing themselves and the fact that there can be repercussions. Uh, you know, we're in this sort of uh, an aside, we're in this upside down paradigm now where um, media technology has made what was completely private now possible of being completely public worldwide. At the same time, where what used to be hard to do, like look at a magazine, is so easy on my iPhone. So we have this upside down situation. But again, that I'd like you to address what do we do about the fear that men have of, of admitting and owning up to uh, uh, such a danger to themselves and to, to their families and to the church? I push on this some in the book, Church Matters. Um, I think it's essential, and, and I understand that part of what I'm asking for here is a change in how we do church, and that's scary. But I really think that, that leaders have to be vulnerable. They have to be willing themselves to go to hard places. They have to be willing themselves to be vulnerable about their own lives, about their own shortcomings. Uh, if a leader isn't willing to do that, it's going to be very difficult for someone to feel comfortable coming to them. 
So they can alleviate a lot of, of fear simply by being open about their own struggles, their own difficulties. I understand that can be overdone, but I think there has to be a, an element of that involved. Thanks, Kerry. We have time for one more question, and then we need to engage the great questions that we have from you all. There's nothing on the tip of your minds. Let's move into the questions. So we've tried to pull these questions together. There's a good many of them. So we've tried to pull them together into some lumps or categories so that at least if we don't answer your question directly, we might hit on it by addressing some other questions as our hope. Probably don't have time to get through them all, but we'll do our very best. So first, um, I'll just start you off with softball. Uh, Mac or IBM? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, Let's start off with this question instead. So the question is, what is considered social media? WhatsApp, Voxer, and then the broader question, how is this affecting us? I think a good definition that we can use can be, we can think about a family. So you have your nuclear family, your mom and your dad, then you have your children, then you have your extended family, your cousins, and so on and so forth. I think a definition of social media that we can use that might be appropriate is a family that is another layer outside of the extended family. It's more superficial. It's pretty much entirely superficial. And the social aspect is you feel like you're a family when you're not really. Yeah, I, I would say it's a, a mediatization of friendships. It actually, uh, the medium that's used, uh, similar to what you mentioned earlier, there are the effects that the medium has on us, uh, formative effects, biases, uh, with logics, they call it media logic, which infiltrate us, but they also uh, shape the relationships. They get shaped. And uh, the Social media, I think, starts to, again, change relationships into a, a mediated form of relationship. But it, the relationships themselves, maybe on face value, look good, like many friends. He calls, me self, calls himself a friend. But it's interesting in the scholarly realm of the studies that are out there that they're, they're pretty much a conclusion that uh, your social media friends aren't social media, they aren't friends. When they do all sorts of experiments, when someone gets in trouble, who's there to help them? And it's almost never a social media friend. It's always the person who's proximal. So something to, to look at in that. Maybe a follow-up question on that is, um, how do you relate to peers who are, you could say, addicted to social media? Not through social media. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, first and foremost, relate to them in real life and as naturally as possible. Uh, and, you know, some of us are more comfortable being forceful than others, but perhaps you can say to that friend who you're struggling to make meaningful connections with, hey, I'd like to take you out for coffee, and by the way, leave your cell phone behind. I want to have a face-to-face -face deep conversation with you and think about what you want that conversation to look like. I think one of our challenges with an issue like social media is we like an issue to be black and white, and many times we try to push every issue into black and white. So social media, for example, there are strong feelings about this issue, um, but there are legitimate reasons for social media. Um, I work with people in restricted countries. Uh, they use it simply because it's encrypted. I can communicate with them back and forth. But the problem with that is, is as soon as we say it's not wrong, then we have people using it for wrong reasons. And, and to me, if um, I personally do not use social media for anything other than business. I, I'm not interested in finding out the details of everyone's life. I furthermore think it's extremely unhealthy to a congregation for someone to be constantly transmitting what they're doing all the time. There's something very egocentric about that. It might feel good to the person, but if they would simply consider from a kingdom perspective the amount of time they're taking in other people's lives, 
in all the details of the daily life that they're transmitting on. Uh, I've heard reports and in, in, I did interviews with people, and every time some, and, and in particular women are worse at this, but every time they turn around, they want to tell somebody about it. And if they have 50 people on their, on their list, someone's getting ding, ding, ding all the time. Imagine the, 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 the wall that's putting up, what it's stopping in that community with regard to reaching out and blessing other people. So just because it's good in some situations does not mean the thing is, is right. There's a wrong perspective of this as well. And I think it's extremely powerful and I think we need to be very warned about it. I think social media can be very deadly in our communities. Uh, we need to be communicating face to face and, uh, and not as much on social media. Let's move on. Sorry, there's a lot to say there. Um, I'm going to throw a hand grenade in. And here's the question. Can the internet be safely used or is complete abstinence the best option? I think as I mentioned before, it's here, it's here to stay. There's a large portion of us here that are already on the internet. Uh, I, I don't recall who said it, maybe it was Brian, someone said something that was very interesting. He said, the Anabaptist people are very good at abstinence, but we're not so good at moderation. And I think that that's an important thing that we need to consider. I think it's too late, you know, we're, we're on the train, someone also said, the train's taken off. I think it's a bit too late to say, can we abstain? Because it's insidious, pervasive, everywhere, whatever word you want to use, it's almost inescapable. I believe the internet can be safely used in many of the same ways that the library can be uh, very useful. However, let's just be honest about the fact that very few of us struggle with overuse of our local library. Yeah, I think it, be, it can safely be used. I think it has to do with the attitude of the user, and that is to absolutely minimize uh, wasteful, wasteful use, minimize detrimental use, and be aware of it, be cognizant that I have a possibility of just wasting my time, wasting other people's time, uh, atrophying myself. I'm aware of that, and I then seek to optimize my own development. I'm constant, we are always developing and to, to make sure that the internet is not a hindrance to that. It can be a help. I mean, I, if you saw my list of reasons, yes please, can you pull? Yeah, thank you. Okay, anybody else? I'll tag another question along with that. Um, one of the ways that technology is really changed the way we live is in families, okay? And it's changed how children are raised, it's changed how young people spend their time, it's changed the level of interaction that parents can give or what they feel like they can give their parent or to their children. Um, so the question here is, how do we as parents lead out with the revolving door of technology especially with our youth who are normally adapting faster than we are. I think the best way to lead out in the area of technology is to lead out, period. So be the kind of person who is living an inspirational life, who has a value-centered life, who is living with all the gusto that you can for the Lord Jesus and for his kingdom and his causes. And, and I think that, you know, as you're doing that, that many of these questions, many of these problems and dilemmas will fall into their proper places and perspective. Kevin, what do you do when, as a parent, you have no idea what's out there? And so you're leading, you have your children's heart, but you don't have a discerning metric for what's good, bad, right, or wrong with respect to anything technological. So how do you, you know, again, do you abstain or how do you moderate? So I think one of the most significant effects of technology is the relationships and attachments that it creates. 
uh, between people and devices. Uh, but there's also other kinds of vices. There's also other kinds of vices related to relationships. Um, and, and we all know uh, that, you know, peer relationships can be very damaging, whether or not technology is in the picture. Uh, and so I would say the best thing to do as a parent is to approach this like you would any other kind of relationship problem and seek to capture the heart of your children. Seek to know your children, to understand them, to communicate love to them, to, um, to get to the place where they can trust you. And um, if this is a difficulty for you, then it should probably be your number one focus in your life. I'm not does a parent. Answer, does that so answer your question? <laughs> to some extent, um, I guess more practically speaking, what, is, what does that mean? How do, you, how do you show that? What are some steps that you do? I think you mentioned you have a, a cell phone area where cell phones are there and only there. Mm -hmm. What other sort of things? Sure, so one of the biggest things I think you can do is um, be the kind of person who's putting intentional practices into your life to make connections with your children. Um, there's, a lot, th there's a lot else that's required behind this, but uh, there's something very beautiful about sitting down for a meal together as often as possible as a family and engaging each other in positive ways around that meal. There's also, there's also a whole host of other things that you can do to make meaningful connections with your children. Take time for your children, read to them if they're young. You know, maybe take them out to eat if they're older. Uh, and, and really pursue their hearts. Don't let the, uh, the precious years waste away without um, actually making them a priority. I'm sorry, I'm not talking about, I apologize, I'm not talking about technology because I just really don't think that it's an essential for a parent to be in the know-how about technology in order to effectively combat the pressures that their children are facing through technology because you will engage with them as you actually engage with the hearts of your children. Here's a challenging question. Wait, okay. one, more, one more thought on that. Um, because of the... Well, two parts to, the, to, this, to this issue. And the first is I think children should be grounded in reality, and the internet is an alternate reality. There is so much false, fake, fabricated information out there, and those children can't tell between real and false at those ages. It's immaturity. That's what immaturity is, a misunderstanding of reality. And so they're now basing their worldviews, their interpretation of true reality, based on the internet, if they're on the internet. It's, it's input, the same with entertainment. When uh, children are in entertainment, they then are interpreting reality, their future interpretations, based on their memory of, of entertainment. Okay, even the uh, American Psychological Association says no screen time before two years old. No screen time. It's too damaging for the child. Okay, because it's, that's the second issue, that it, the screen time, the technological screen time, formats the mind, aside from what nature does in forming, or natural reality forms the mind. And the problem is at those ages, their mind is changing so fast that the little entertainment, the little internet interaction they have has a long-term impact. One more quick thing, if I could say this about this. I would like my father to stand up, please. So, lest you misunderstand me, I'm not trying to sit here and give advice as if I'm an expert parent. I'm just repeating what my father did for me, okay? So, if you need a face to talk to, there's a lot of good fathers here. But if you need a face to talk to about how to parent your children, um, that would be a good one. I think sometimes we underestimate also the fact that many of our youth are craving leadership. Uh, there's a home in our community where they invited uh, young people in, I think it was every Tuesday night, just children, youth from the community to come in. And they wanted just to have time with them, build relationships with them, reach out to them. They had a basket right inside the door, and it had a sign on it that said this, we like social more than media. Put your phones here. These were young people that were not coming from Christian homes, but they all obediently shut off their phones and put it in the basket and enjoyed an evening without it. So sometimes we think that, that leadership won't work. But I think sometimes we have youth that are actually craving real relationships. We have time for just one final question here. I'm going to make this as practical, as specific as I can. Now, you know there's 
uh, there's concern anymore about the, the really addictive nature of smartphones just as a platform, with studies saying that you know, the, the average power user of a smartphone is touching their phone something like 5,000 times a day. Um, so something about the platform there that really wants to get your attention, it wants to suck you in. Um, I'll just make this as practical as I can, I guess. Where have you seen smartphone use done well? And what are some of the practices that you've observed? Creative ideas, like when you come to our house, we're going to have supper, put your phone in the basket, it stays out there. Um, things like that. Anything that you can, you can pull out of your memory here that say that, that seems to have worked. I would say this real, real briefly. Uh, when I was doing interviews, that's one thing I observed was that that youth who are doing well typically have older people who have built relationships with them, and there's leadership there. It's not, it's not older people just turning them loose, neither is it older people just saying no, but they're working with them through this process. I think that's very important, Gary. A lot of the times, people that are my age, there's this disconnect in terms of age, and then there's this disconnect in terms of technology, and often we hear no all the time. And so what ends up happening is there's something that's very jarring. Here's this person that I'm supposed to look up to and respect, and yet they seem to be keeping me at a distance, so to speak. So I think that the formation of those relationships are very important. Um, and I think also to speak to the question, I think we can use a practical example of how us four panelists kind of engage this panel. We did use technology. Joel presented us with an initial email, all introducing each other. We exchanged ideas and thoughts back and forth via email. Then we had a conference call. We tried to have a conference call. We tried to have a conference call. Uh, I guess it was successful because we're all here. So, and during that, we used it as a medium. It was something that we could have, you know, talked endlessly for hours about idle things, but we used it for a purpose, and we had a purpose in mind when we were using it. And I think that, as I mentioned before, are we going to just be consuming content with these mediums, or are we going to, is there some end to this technology that, that's fulfilling my purpose, that's fulfilling the call that Jesus has put on my life? A couple of things on that. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's interesting studies coming out now that Social media use is related to lowering IQ. Very interesting to find that because of the shallow levels. And uh, well, that was another point, sorry. What I, what I want to say is subduing this media. Subduing it through ordering your life. Again, what has worked for me? I don't always do it, but for great periods of time I will do this. I have my at the end of my devotion time in the morning, I have my to-do list and I have my to-don't list. So my to-don't list, sometimes that includes, you know what? Today, no. And I will say I will, I will do this sometimes and, some, and it makes some people mad. Unless I have something urgent coming, ring her off, no internet. To, from eight in the morning till eight at night, I have too many, too many important things to do. Too many things. I can't let this thing distract me. So it lets me focus deep. And that's what they're finding. That's what I, why I brought that up now. I remember why. Is that we're in this um, scattered mindset now by the, the in, t internet technology pinging us and it's creating people that cannot focus and go deep and think thoroughly. Okay? That's the IQ issue. And so I've decided, no, I'm not going to let this turn me into a shallow person, I subdue it. I have times when I look at it, sometimes I don't look at it. I'll pick a time now for this hour at lunchtime, I need to do some shopping for certain things, I'll do that, then stop it. But I'm not letting it rule me. Okay. That's all we have time for. Rule the medium, don't allow the medium to rule you. Thanks, Harry. Uh, I think that's all we have time for here. Kurt, we will conclude and then I'll invite you back up. You have the floor.